So good evening, everybody, and welcome to our Monday, the 6th of September jam event. Now, we've been doing some things differently over the last 16 to 18 months. Well, first of all, this thing came called a pandemic, and it was, what are we going to do? Because we normally meet, and I say normally, we would meet in a space at the university once a month, always on the first Monday. And then from March 2020, we started holding our events online. So we've been running online jams and we had our 100th jam where we had panel events and we've been running online jams for eight, 16 months or so. And then some people, one of them's called Josh, started saying, Alan, when do you think we might return to physical events? And we weren't really sure if that was something that we should be doing. We said, well, let's have an idea. And some people said, oh, well, if you're doing physical events, we won't be able to come. So we're exploring and trying things towards running hybrid events. So we have some online, some physical in person, and then somewhere there's a mix for both. So a week ago, just over a week ago, Saturday the 28th of August, we held our very first Preston Make Fest. Still got some of the, my desk is full of all of the things left over, the bunting and the programs and all of that. So this evening's event, which is going live on YouTube. We're recording it for people to watch afterwards. What we're going to do is we're going to take you on a whistle stop tour of the event. Now, our plan was to record video interviews with presenters, and we did that, but um, we perhaps didn't put as much time and energy and effort into the quality of the audio. So the video quality, the images from the video are great but the sound isn't so easy to hear people. So originally the plan had been to play videos from the event. Now those videos, I will share them with you in a little while and you can go and watch them, but you might find you have to play around with your audio settings. So what I'm gonna do now, if I just put a screen share back on, I'm gonna share with you what the plan is for this evening's event. It's slightly different from advertised. So it's still called Make Prayers to Action Replay. And at the moment, we're in the introduction and welcome. And over the next 15 minutes or so, I'm gonna take you on a brief tour using photographs. I will highlight and pick out a few things that you might have seen if you were able to get there, or if you were there, think it will remind you of things. And if later on, anybody's got some photos they can add to that folder, that would be fantastic. Right, following that, from 7.15, right through till about 8.25, some of our presenters from MakeFest are able to join us this evening and we're going to have some informal discussions with them reflected on the highlights. So Erin will be up in a few moments and I'll be asking Erin, um, like, what, what was it you brought along and, and what kind of reaction did you find? You know, what worked really well? Did people really engage with these things that you had on display? And then if we were doing more of these, and we are planning to do more, plan to do at least three more like this next year, what might we do differently as organizers or what might you do differently? And it may be that for Erin, for example, might independently go to some other events and bring some of the same things along, but based on what happened last week and her, her reflections and, and that she might do things a little bit differently. When we talk to Brian and Spencer and a few others, these are some of the people who've been to a few of these kind of events and they also may say, well, when I was at another event. But anyway, so what I wanna do now is using some photos, I want to show you some of the highlights from the event and then I need to finish doing so in the next 10 minutes so we can go and have a chat with Erin. Now, um, those people who are watching live on YouTube you can use the chat to type things. We don't normally record the chat and share it with people afterwards. So don't worry too much about that. But if there's certain things, certain questions, then, then please share them. Do you know what I'm gonna do as well? I'm gonna share a link to this document now, and I'm gonna post it into the chat on YouTube. Why am I doing that? Well, it means you've got a handy link now to the program as the event goes on. But I've changed it so that anybody can comment. And there's a section in the document. Uh, okay, <laughs> close that. There's a sec section in this document that says that things that worked really well, things that would have been even better. And what you could do if you have the time or the inclination, you could highlight something there, add a comment, 
and then I will can read the comment and I can just add that onto that document. So it's not exactly edit to like, allow everybody to edit, but you can contribute to the document. So I would invite you to do so, please. Okay, um, I will also share a link to, this is a photo album. Some of them people have shared on social media, these photos. Some of them are photos I've taken and some of them are taken from the video. Now, each of the videos that we did record, we recorded about 10. I have uploaded them all to YouTube. I have made a playlist with them in and you can go and have a look. But you heard what I said, the quality. We tried using a Bluetooth microphone and it just didn't work very well at all. So I'm going to go into slideshow mode with this particular photo album now. And you're going to hear me narrate, uh, explain some of the things. So here we go. So welcome to our action replay of the MIGFest event, which happened in Preston in the city of Lancashire, County Lancashire, on the 28th of August. So um, in the lead up to the event, we had an open call for anybody who would like to come and present to bring something along. And some people we had to kind of nudge them and twist their arms just a little bit because there were some people like like John who we'll talk about later on like do you really want yes we do so um we we had these programs printed very nice they are too Matt Moore helped with some of the artwork and when people turned up we put them into their hand and said go explore go have a look around there's things on the first floor things in the balcony and do that so um you can find these images online if you go and look for them um, we also, we thought it'd be nice as we were given the opportunity to take over the Harris Museum. It will be being closed in a few months. They do, they're refurbishing it all. It's probably going to take a few years. So we had some bunting made and we strung that around all over the place to give it that flavor. And, um, and uh, we were able to stick it. The, the staff were really, really kind of positive and welcoming that they allowed us to do that. We got a little bit of coverage in the Evening Post, who created a little bit of a media uproar when they they said, look at this R2-D2 robot, which is going to appear. And of course, uh, an army of geeks came along and said, no, that, ladies and gentlemen, is a Dalek. But that was kind of nice because it, it meant people engaged. And sure enough, R2-D2 did turn up. What an amazing project that is. Now, if you talk to Darren, who made it, he will let on that it's probably taken about seven years <laughs> to build this. But it is absolutely incredible. And what a crowd stopper it was. It was out on the flag market, it was moving around. And every time, well, it, it didn't move that much because the moment it did move, well, we'll come back to that in a moment, people wanted to pose for photos with it. So um, if you were ever organizing an event and you know somebody, so there's another group in Preston, they dress up as stormtroopers and in, in it'd be worth perhaps seeing if you could get some people to volunteer to support your event in that kind of way. And it, it just really helped. In the back of the photo, you can't quite see, but we had two absolutely wonderful STEM ambassadors, Linda and Stuart Shave, and they agreed to help us on, on, on the day and, and recruit people. We also uh, had a little bit of a plug on, on the local radio. And that's something else I would suggest to anybody who's doing something like this before. It was really nice uh, to do that. So as I mentioned, we, we adorned this gallery with our bunting wherever we could um, and we used masking tape it was all paper based so that it you know it, it could be recycled or reused and we just used some ribbon and masking tape to, to, to string that up so uh, let me go back a bit so this bit here this is known as the ring balcony um, a beautiful space lots of ambient light but not the best place to plug things in so we were a bit that was one of the things we struggled a little bit with. There's a gallery called Discover Preston, which tells a little bit about the history of Preston and um, Cromwell and all these kind of things. So we found in that space, there was lots of power sockets. We used that. And then there was the ground floor cafe area, which is next to the library. We thought we might see a lot of traffic. Now, the aim of this event was really to move out the university for a day and say, hello, people of Lancashire, Preston, the world. This is us, this is what we do. Um, so in doing so, we strategically placed some of our exhibits and displays in places where there was a lot of football. So um, so Erin and Rachel and Lara, they had a table set up over there. And it was it was it was beautifully arranged, it was decorated with all sorts of books to support learning, a lot using microbit. And Erin, who we will meet in a few moments, had some projects there. Pretty much every time I went past, 
I can't say it was absolutely packed because that probably wouldn't have helped too much. So we, we, that's why we spread things out around. There was always groups there. And what was really lovely was watching the looks of engagement. We had some photographers and captured some really nice images of families engaging with that. Now also in the, oh, here is one of the photographs. So you can actually see Erin in the photo, Rachel and Lara. And it was just so lovely, families wandering through and, um, and, and, and finding out more. And so many people said, oh, they'd never heard of a micro bit. They didn't know there was all these things out there. Um, and here's some photos from Erin's table. I will share a link to this album and you can go and look at them later yourself. We recorded an interview with Erin. It's probably one of the only ones where you can hear the audio clearly. And I will share a link to that a little bit later on and then you can listen for, you, for yourself. Um, so it was a make fest, but we also had uh, Dan, who is a maths teacher. He brought his family along. He's recently published a book all through lockdown. Uh, Dan has been running online talks and activities and lessons called help your kids maths and because it was very much a family event I thought, well, so we persuaded dan to come and join us and using mario maker and some challenges uh, there was high levels of fun hijinks and engagement going on where children were competing against each other in these challenges and um, again very lovely sounds hearing them all bouncing around and and there was with, with a small hand uh, portable console, children could create some of their own challenges. So um, one of Dan's family was there supporting that. OK, so I mentioned the R2D2. Absolutely incredible. Um, I mean, if you were to commission and ask me to you're talking about many thousands of pounds, I guess. So not really competing fairly on the same level as some of the projects. Like when we talked to Spencer, I think Spencer had about 15 different projects all spanning one year on his table. So uh, please don't judge. Don't think Spencer's projects are no, uh, no, not as worthy or anything. It, it, talking to Darren, it sounded like, Darren, this is the, uh, the creator of this. He'd spent almost every waking hour over the last seven years with this fantastic creation. But it, it, and Darren, there's a video record with Darren, apologies about the audio quality, but Darren talks about how they often bring these to charitable events. So if you know somebody in this area, in, in the Northwest of England, but Darren said there's also, in, in the video he mentioned that there's a group where you can connect up with other makers of robots and uh, find out about helping raise money for charity. Um, uh, lots of families throughout the day wanted to pose with R2D2. So um, I mentioned earlier that we had some lovely, wonderful STEM ambassadors who gave up their time to support us. So this is Linda. So, so Linda has actually written books on computer science, artificial intelligence, and had them published online. And she was just so happy to support and help us. And um, people said she was doing a great job going out on the street, giving out programs, encouraging people to come in. So thanks to Linda and Stuart for stepping up and helping us with that. Now, um, one of the things we've missed through the lockdown is just chilling and hanging out with our friends. Uh, we've tried to do, incorporate a little bit of that into our breakout rooms when we run them. Um, but it was so lovely to see Heed. So we, he, is his nickname, Michael lives over in Huddersfield and he traveled over and it, he was saying it's just so lovely. There's a little video interview where the audio isn't so great. And, and we're just chatting, catching up on what people were doing. And it, it makes you realize how much face-to-face -face really does um, help uh, in, in some ways. And um, the, this photo here, I'm having a conversation with Rachel and in the background, there's Garrick and Jasmine. Again, some people who volunteered to step in last minute and take some wonderful photos to the event. So it was just nice to see such a community uh, feel to the thing. So we're, we're moving around some more of the exhibits. So I thought, come on, Alan, you know, what can I do? So I brought along my cardboard museum of computing. Um, I was kind of entertained with the idea that I found a box at home that everything all just fit into that box and nothing else. So I brought the box along. Um, I didn't really spend much time at the table. I was flacking around trying to go and see what everybody else had. Um, but people said that they'd seen the photos, they wanted to touch them and handle them. So uh, to, to an extent, we uh, allowed some of that. 
Um, so we're now inside the Discover Preston Gallery. I am running a little bit over time. I'll try and get through this in the next few minutes. So um, within Discover Preston, we had roughly, rough count, we had eight stalls. So we have Gary here on the right-hand side with his 3D printed robots. And Kevin with planetary models. We then had over in the corner, Gory, who's a young student who had her A-level project with her. And she's going off to uh, study computer science at Goldsmiths in, in London. We had these two centre tables here with Brian and Spencer, and they brought along various projects that, that they've been working on. Just behind, you can just see John there in the, in the background. So John is one of our Preston Jam makers. And then we had Tom, Wilmi Tom Williamson, lovely big colourful banner there, Wi-Fi sheep. Tom had brought along some computers that you can build and program yourself. And then next to them, we had Anthony Ball. So Anthony and I have known each other since the, one of the very first computing clubs in Preston back in the 80s. And Anthony was showing how to design, make, and program and publish games. And then we had two families, um, one from Longridge, one from Garstang, that were work, showing us projects that they'd worked on. So keeping an eye on the time, I think what I'm going to have to do now is I'm going to have to wrap this up quite quickly. But just to say, um, we do have some videos you can hear, uh, I will share links to them where I'm talking to Gary about his robot, Kevin with his models uh, that for people to assemble. There's an interview with Gory where we talk about her computer science project. And um, we're, we're going to speak to Spencer shortly about his projects. We're going to hear from Brian as well, just after Spencer. So Brian's going to be showing and discussing his reflections and feelings on the event. And John will also be joining us. So, so, so John doesn't usually present. So it's so lovely that John's going to join us tonight. We have Tom. Tom's brought some slides along to talk about his project. And Anthony is going to join us as well. And we're going to share some reflections. And then after Anthony, Josh will be our final discussion of the evening. And something happened to the R2D2 we might reveal later on. And what was so lovely at the end, um, it was suggested to us that we get a group photo. So I managed to recruit some other volunteers. So a, a young uh, scientist, I think she's aged about 13, 14, she took these photos and um, there we are. So I think what I'm going to do now is I'm going to see if I can get Erin's attention. Alan calling Erin. Are you there, Erin? Can we hear you? So Erin's waving at me. Good evening, Erin. Now, what we could do now is we could just talk to the camera or you could say, oh, put back some of those photos, Alan. We could talk about those if you want. I just talk. Talk to the camera. OK, so Erin, we I show some photos of the things that you had on your table. Um, is this the first kind of event where you've presented things like this to the public, would you say? Um, well, it's definitely like that's the most people I've actually had like to, pre to present to, but I have presented to people before. And when, when people were coming over, in fact, a few times I had to come back because it was quite busy at times. What, what were people saying? Were they surprised? Were they delighted? Were, uh, well, were... I just, well, they weren't really, they were just looking. And then I just, just said, um, hi, do you know what we're doing at this workshop? And they, mo oh, most of them would say no. And, and then I'd just say, do you know what I'm, so do you know what a microbit is? And most of them would say no. So I'd explain what it is. And I just said it's a mini computer, which you can code stuff on. And then I just said what we're doing. So I said, we're gonna, we're just attaching a micro bit to a carrot and a chicken up in the air, making, it's gonna make a sound. And, and we saw some photos of families uh, interacting with that. Did you find you had to do a lot of explaining? Like, oh, well, it's like a computer, but it doesn't have a screen. And if you want to screen, did, did you have to do a lot of technical and explanation, would you say? Yeah, I had to do a lot of explaining because, like, a lot of people just um, were around in town and then just decided to come in their museum. And so all these new, like, all these creations. And, yeah. Do you think anybody was a little bit terrified or like, ooh, 
will I get an electric shock if I um, if I do anything with this or? Nah. No, no one okay. said any. No one was scared. Did you find people who were wanting to ask questions like, "Oh, where do I find out more about this?" or, or you know, how do I start doing? Because you sound very. I was listening in. You sound very, very confident when you're talking to people you've never met before about the things that you've been doing. Did you find that they were asking you advice about where to get started? No, they weren't. <laughs> like all our stuff they were just listening and then I said do you want to have a go at any of our games and then they said yeah and I said come back in a while we might have steady hand game ready um, now uh, for people who don't know uh, I would I, I would describe you Erin as being a pupil at a primary school in upper key stage two so you're am I right in thinking you're go, you've just gone into year six yeah okay so i'm going to ask you now to imagine a time in the future like a year from now when you're just about to go into year seven or maybe two years away going into year eight and you're coming along to another one of these events and you maybe have two or three other friends who are coming what might you do differently in a year's time if you were doing the same thing again would you do it exactly the same or would you change some of them i would change a lot of it because um, like if my friends would be there, um, like I just instead of doing my own opinion, I'd let them, like I'd like see if they wanted to what they wanted to do, and then I'll tell, tell you what I want to do, and we'll do a vote. But if it's a complete tie, and there's one person you can't choose, um, we'll just go, and then we'll just let them go off, and then and then they just make their own thing, and then come back, and then. Just show it and then we can just put it all on the table. When we've done events like this before, but not this event, we've been able to run workshops in classes. But when we were planning it this time, because of COVID, we thought, no, no, we'll just have people really look at things. If you were doing a workshop or a class, and again, if you had some helpers, could you think of any kind of activity that might be fun for like 20 minutes or something? Off the, maybe off the top of your head? Um, yeah, I'll, 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 I just, yeah, I'll let them, like, I just, so you know how, like, teachers tend to, like, get a light, so if you've got a work sheet or, like, something on, a, like, laptop and you, have, you don't know what your password is, they put, like, hand everything out on them, but I would do that, but I'd do it with, like, all the micro bits, and then I'd do all the USBs, and then... Just and I'll say how to plug it in. And I'll let them come up and then just, you know, try to go to it. Okay. Now I've got one more question. Now I've realised that one of the challenges when you're at one of these events, if you're somebody like you, gets excited easily. But if you're staying at the stall all the time, you don't really get to see much. Now I somebody told me that you left your stall for a little bit, and then you saw something. And you got really excited about this thing that you'd seen. And when you came home, you couldn't stop talking about it. Are you prepared to tell us what it was that you saw and what's happened afterwards? Oh, well, I saw, um, I don't know what his name was. Was his name Brian, maybe? Yeah, his name yeah. was Brian. And then he had this remote control robot. And I just thought, oh, wow, that's actually really impressive. And now I'm thinking, oh, why don't I try and do that? So I'm going to try and do that. But instead of just a remote control robot, I'm going to make a motion sensor and like a light sensor. And we're going to try and get a micro bit, which is a microphone. And so when I clap it, when I clap two times like this, maybe something will happen. Now, I happen to know that you're a member of a, a club or a group that meets up once a week as well. And this is where I started getting excited. I started thinking, oh, well, if Erin's working on a like a robot project, which I think you're planning to use micro bits for, it could even be that at some point in the future, this club, some of them come together to do it. And it may be that in a year's time, when you come to another event like this, you could show people, well, we got inspired when we came to Preston Lake Fest and we went away and this is what we've made. I don't know, maybe I'm just getting carried away. 
there. No, I'm Erin. Not to do that. Okay. Erin, thank you so much for joining us this evening and for everything that you did around Make Prest or Preston Make Fest and for inspiring other people and also for being a little bit inspired yourself. Thank you very much. Okay. So we're now going to ask Spencer to join us. So Spencer is somewhere lurking there in the background. Can you hear me, Spencer? Um, is anyone from the dark side of that? <laughs> so, um, so Spencer, do you need do, do do we need to look at the photos? And we've already shared the photos. You see the photos, yeah. Yeah. Um, perhaps share that funny one later, maybe if if you want to. I don't mind. Um, oh my goodness, it was a long day. I left the house at eight a.m. I got home at nine p.m. But it was a really, really brilliant day. Um, my little suitcase on the train. I didn't even know where Preston was. I knew it was near Blackpool. I knew it was north of Birmingham. Um, I knew it was up north somewhere. So I came up and what a day it was. Um, I've missed this so much. I've missed the face-to-face -face events really, really badly. And it was so lovely to be at the Preston um, Museum there and actually have all the people coming around and looking at basically what has been for me seven months of digital making. So thank you so much for having me because it was really cool. Thank you. I'm just sharing a photo on the screen. <laughs> we had a we had a conversation afterwards, which I'm really glad that we did. Our our plan had been to go around and record video interviews with everybody, and it was one of those plans that sounded great in the planning stage, but we should have tested it or raised some money and paid a team to come and do it. And that you know that's a big lesson there to learn. But we recorded a video outside, and it's one of the few ones that you can actually hear. <laughs> and we had a chance to discuss and reflect. And you were telling me just how nice it was uh, to travel to an event, you know, get your head around the event, that, that which is we've not been traveling for such a long time. You said it was so lovely to meet people face to face. Did, did yeah, you find I, I'm sorry. I was just saying, I just totally agree that actually with COVID, um, doing everything remotely has been brilliant. I mean, I think I've been to every single jam you run remotely during the whole of pandemic but actually to be with just to watch people picking up my 3d prints holding them looking at them was so wonderful and i think every store in the venue everyone was so excited to see what people had even if it was just like models and stuff everyone was like oh what's that who made it where did it come from now i suffered from really bad r2d2 envy when I saw that big full-size one come wheeling up, I thought, oh no, my little one is going to be put to shame. And I, I completely forgot his name, the guy who made it. Um, Darren Paulson. Darren. Darren was so lovely when he said to me, no, 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 it's not about size, you know, you could still make a smaller one and still be part of the R2DT club. And that was really kind of quite cool, actually. Now, if I play some sound effects, will you get a copyright content strike on YouTube? Or is that going to be okay? We, we might have to blurt out some of the obvious things if we can okay well i'm, I'm just gonna hit um run on my terminal just a second yeah that's probably not too bad <laughs> okay yeah yeah that's probably okay as well right, we'll stop that okay yeah. yeah because one of the things i got wrong oh uh, it's the only thing i got wrong on the whole day was i thought oh we're in a museum let's keep it not too loud so i set the volume about 50 percent, and no one could hear it so he spent the whole day singing away, playing the music, and it didn't hear anything, apart from if you put your ear right next to it. So that was, that was my take home, is make it loud, make it loud. Well, I don't know if it's any consolation. Just let me share another photo. Um, the multi-million pound R2-D2 that Darren brought along that's taken from seven years, it did, had a, it did have a mishap. Did you hear what happened? No, I didn't. What happened? Well, as I'm sure you know, R2-D2's head can pivot <laughs> and there's a worm and worm wheel uh, no it's a rack and pinion mechanism that, that is used to rotate and apparently this R2-D2 couldn't thought he'd seen himself at a distance or a much smaller version and turned its head so far it actually untwisted there's a wiring loom inside and it ripped the wires off and it, lost, oh, no. it meant it lost all communications. It could the, the bottom half could still move around, not literally half, but the, the bottom section. And uh, 
which meant we got to have a look inside the R2D2 to see how it was constructed. Um, there was another photo there, we just got a, a bit of a closer look, um, which is a bit of a shame um, in, in a way. I mean, I, I, I got the impression that Darren would be able to fi fix it quite easily. Now, something really exciting came out at the end of the day for me um, as I was traveling back on the train back to Birmingham New Street. And I've been making projects, almost one project every month for the last two, three years. And I, all my projects are 3D printed, mostly got Raspberry Pis in them, micro bits, Arduinos. And I've made a decision and I'm going to make a 1 16th scale proper motorized R2D2. So in my project for the next 18 months, maybe two years, it's going to be 100% 3D printed. Um, it's going to work, it's going to move around, and hopefully in Makefest 2023, I should be able to bring it up and let it scooting around next to the big one. So I've actually come away from um, the Makefest actually inspired to do a new project for myself, which wow. I'm really chuffed about. So thank you. My wife's not, mm, she's a bit, okay. We, we agreed on 1 16th because it wasn't too big and it wasn't too small. <laughs> Spencer, you and I, we've met at some other events like Makefest, Cambridge, we've met at some. Um, I, I, I've met you also at Birmingham at, at some Raspberry Jam themed mm -hmm. events. Based on what you've seen and, and what happened in Preston, if we were running three more like this in 2022, can you think of things that you think would have made the event even better? Um, you touched on it a second ago. I think if I'd had my big flight case of Raspberry Pis, I would have brought it with me on the train and I would have set up a little room and done a little workshop. I think the workshop bit is the bit we need to add next time, whether it's maybe in that space back at the university. But I think some actual kind of real, more hands-on stuff because the show and tell was wonderful. But I think people wanted things to play with. What can I, what can I play with more? Because there was a lot of great stuff to see but perhaps more to actually kind of play with and experience. And I think Erin said the same thing, the bit about the micro bit as well. Yeah, so I agree. I, I, I feel more comfortable with an event if we are putting on a, a workshop or it's hands-on that people can get involved in. But um, the issue was when we were planning this event, Co the COVID restrictions oh, are still in place and it was no, no. And it, we were trying to figure out how we would cope with all of the social distancing and, and all of that. And, and also I, I think though, Alan, I think the genie is out of the bottle now. <laughs> now, I, I keep saying this, two years ago, we couldn't live stream events. Oh, that was too difficult. But now we know that we can run an in-person event we can do a Zoom event, stream to YouTube. And I think we need to do a big Alan Star mashup of mashing up the physical event with an online kind of stream of it as well, or much more interactive. Because I'd love to come to Preston, but it was, it was a five hour round trip. So if I could have Zoomed in from Birmingham and said, hey, look at my projects from here, and we showed it in Preston, that would be really cool. Because I think, particularly in the evening style events, it's too far to come from Birmingham after school, but I think the hybrid event it's definitely going to be one of the things moving forwards. Yeah, yeah, I think as well, one of the tricky things, if you were presenting a workshop, you wouldn't then be able to bring your suitcase of all of your projects to put on display. Um, but not everybody's comfortable running workshops. Uh, not everybody, like myself included, I, I don't normally have things to put on display. It just so happened I started building things out cardboard, and which was a bit unusual. Spencer, once again, thank you for everything. Thank you for traveling up. Thank you for your uh, support in, in every way. I know you've been tweeting about it lots and sharing things on mm -hmm. social media. And um, we won't require you to attend any, all of, the, of them. Obviously, distance is a bit of an issue. and We're trying to reduce the amount of travel that we do. But it would be so lovely if you can join in, particularly with the hybrid ones in the future. Oh, and, yeah. and for people... Audience watching at home, Spencer and I had a good long conversation, which we recorded a lot of it. I'll share the link later. And um, considering, you know, how is it, you know, if we'd been at that event, we'd have some kind of fixed spot. Could we invite people in to, to present to the camera and audience at home and in person could watch at the same time? Right. Thank you, Spencer.
That's Ooh. you off the hook now. And if I'm right, I think it's Brian we're going to next. Uh, I think I might have to go and hunt Brian down. <laughs> I think Brian is lurking in our green room at the moment. So um, let me just go and see if Brian's ready there to join us. So um, I did say before I was going to share some links to the video. And um, I think uh, all of the videos, I, if, if I don't do it during tonight's event, I will in include it in the description. I've decided not to publicly share them on YouTube because the quality isn't the best. Um, but you, when, once you get the link, you will be able to watch um, all of the videos. Brian, can we Hi. hear you? Yes. Wow, what a what a, an interesting background you've got behind you there. You, I can see all sorts of colours and contraptions. <laughs> Have you tidied up, especially for our event this evening? Uh, no, it's a mess at the moment. It's just in the back. It's just because it's far away. You're um, saying it's a mess. Mm -hmm. Oh, it, 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 it's a mess. So it's. Uh, okay. It does look pretty. Oh. Oh, we can see the floor now. Oh, and all the little drawers on. Wow. So, I think we've got a new feature here for future online jams inside mm -hmm. your workspace. How tidy it is. That looks amazing. It, I can see a timber ceiling. Is that, are you in an outbuilding? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm in a garden as well, uh, a cabin. So, yeah, away from the house. So it's, it, it, it's my toy room. It's where I come to play. And does it get cold in the winter? Uh, no, it's fully insulated. So it, it's actually one of the warmest places in the house when all the computers and screens and everything's on. I thought you were telling me you've got a stack of original Raspberry Pis. You just switch them yeah. on, get them doing complex calculations and it soon warms up in there. Um, there's quite a few Pis in here, but most of the time they're switched off. Now, Brian, if there was a prize for the furthest traveled to make Preston, I think the prize would have been the Corteal family because it wasn't just yourself, you, you, you brought other members along and you've traveled from Cambridge, is that right? Uh, yeah, yeah, tra traveled up from Cambridge, sorry. It's very rare we get visitors up to Preston from Cambridge. So thank you so much for, for, for joining us there. And you well, brought such a fascinating array of projects. I mean, some of them are quite hard to describe to people who haven't seen them. They're, they're, they're kind of artistic, conceptual inventions. Can you describe one of them to us? And I'll see if I've got some photos I can show. Um, so the, I think the, the most probably the favorite with, especially with families is the Naughty and Nice machine. So that's the, the, uh, the white cube. Um, it might appear on the screen in a moment. <laughs> so uh, let's see. Uh, Oh, I've just seen the white cube there. It's in the corner. Yeah, over so here. it's that one there. Um, and um, basically, it's it, it, it's a it's a machine that can tell how. Oh, yeah, that's a better view of it. Yeah. Um, say how how naughty you you've been. So in in where you can see the blue and the blue thing, you put your hand in, and uh, press press one of the buttons on the front, and then it gives you a naughtiness rating. Um, and um, I think, and funny enough, kids always come out less naughty than their parents. I wonder why that might be. Uh, yeah. Is it, uh, is it a completely uh, random thing, or is it? Does it? Oh uh, no, no, it's not random at all. Um, it's um, is it a trade secret you don't want to reveal. No, it's a secret. Um, <laughs> no, it's okay. Maybe it's uh, no, it's, it, it, if you put nothing in there and press the button, it'll come out with zero. Um, and yeah, and it, nine out of ten times, depending on the, the age difference between, well, not the age difference, how old the child is, is they will always normally come out less naughty than their parent. Uh, but if you, it's actually got uh, one of the original uh, Ranty Pie Model A's on on top uh, with, with a camera so you can see you can see the ribbon 
I think you can sometimes now, so. zoom in a little bit, but that's about as far as I can go. Yeah, so there's a ribbon. Oh, so there's a camera. So it's there's a camera on the top. So, so it could be something to do with light or ambient light. So, well, basically, it takes a photograph of the hand. I'm letting the I'm letting the zigra out, and it counts the number of blue pixels you can see. Okay. Oh, sorry, no, not the blue pixels. The number of pixels that are not blue, <laughs> and and then it's got some weird maths to, and then, and then it's converted into a percentage. Okay. Now you had a whole interesting array of robots as well, and this one here, this is a robot in progress, isn't it? Um, yes, that's that's Doofus. It's based on the uh, the Raspberry Pi mascot. The Pi Wars. Oh, yeah, sorry, the mascot, yeah. mascot. Yeah. Um, just so we don't get sued by any other companies in uh, Cambridge that say we're trying to misappropriate their logo or anything. Um, so, and you've you've published today online some updates that you've made. Yeah, so this. it's got a thing. Let's see if I can share mine. Okay, I'll switch mine off for a moment. So uh so i i was intrigued it looked like it had two um antennae on it oh going the wrong way yeah don't worry and then we'll have a little bit of a chat about what That's do great. you think worked best in terms of the so you can see that i, I decapitated him briefly oh. <laughs> um and I, 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 i've been fixing uh neo pixels behind his eyes so they they can grow, and he's uh, he's had a he's had an ear job as well. So the ears have been shortened. Um, so it does look a lot more friendly than the last time I saw it. So well, th th there is one to uh, put the field <laughs> gold into. Yeah? No, no, that doesn't look friendly at all. <laughs> so the um, the, LED, the the white LEDs they 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 just uh, been taken off uh, Poundland. Fairy lights, back to fairy lights. And um, I don't think I took any of the thing there. there. There's, a, there's one of these old ears. Um, and we did have uh, another robot, um, much larger one, humanoid. Yes. That scared quite a few people. And I think it may have been the fact that it didn't have cute, friendly eyes like Doofus does. Thing I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to put so like a cheesy smile across here as well. So the word so, doofus is one that comes up a lot in our house. I know it can be used to um, to criticise somebody. You might call them a doofus, but it's also I don't know if it's a Lancashire thing or not. But they used to refer to as the indeterminate gadget, the thing, the remote control, the doofus is the is the oh, yeah. the thing you jig that. The thing we Bob that does the job or or whatever. Is that is that a Cambridge thing as well that they, people refer to? Uh, as I, I I I don't know why I, I I've heard it used in that. Yeah. Um in in that way. Um but it, it's more more of a it, it, it's just as what um the, the Pie Wars people call call their mascots. Yeah. So, so the, logo, and when, when I was working in schools, um, and some teachers would carry a USB storage uh, flash media on a lanyard around their neck, and they also referred to it as a doofus rather than calling it one of those other names. So, so Brian, um, um, it was it was quite a big trip. In fact, it involved an overnight stay for you and your family to come up yeah. to Preston. Um, I daren't ask, was it worth it? <laughs> because I mentioned there was a few words at home about, mm, you know, Preston. Where is that? It's a long way up. Uh, well, it won't, it, yes, it, 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 it was worth it. Um, it was nice to, to actually meet people in, in, in flesh. Um, and, yeah, just to get, you know, just to get uh, some, like, real reactions to to my projects well, um, one of the yeah. aims of the event was to inspire and engage uh, others particularly young people to do things like this and we already know from here in erin that 
after she'd seen your robots, her head was just full of all sorts of ideas. And she, her mom's right. been telling me now that she's like a thing possessed, <laughs> like, you know, thinking about how she's going to build this next, uh, her next project that she's going to work on. And all other projects now have, have gone on the shelf. <laughs> So it, it definitely helped achieve the objective. You've been to a lot of other um, similar kind of festivals and events. Is this something you feel th that we still got to consider in including for future events and that could be improved upon? Um, I, I, I would have thought uh, maybe some uh, workshops if possible. Yeah. The, the hands-on workshops is definitely something that was missed at this event and that would have added um, something to it. But uh, not everybody's comfortable running workshops. You know, some people are happy to sit in a workshop, but they don't necessarily want to be leading one yeah. as such. And, I, and, and I, I suppose maybe having some things out, outside to be able to attract and drag people in. Yeah, like an army of um, cyborgs. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> to round them up and uh, you know get them in the door yeah that would be a really good yeah. idea i wonder if we can get we can get gary printing some more robots in his in his living room <laughs> um yeah i i just so to to draw to think i i, I don't know where the um because i don't know preston it's saying where the footfall would be yeah well we yeah certainly the audience that were going in there some of them were just going in to to, to pick up their library books and they they yeah. got a little bit more than they bargained for thanks to thanks to you and everybody else brian thank you so much for joining us as we oh, talk okay. through our highlights of the jam and if i'm right i think the next person we go to is tom have yep. i got that right yep so um so so tom thank you for joining us this evening as we reflect back on our highlights of Preston Makefest. Thank you very much, Alan. If I'm correct, I think the first time we met in person was at a Stafford Raspberry Jam. It, was, it wasn't actually. No, oh, okay. It was sta close, Starbridge. Oh my gosh, that's right. Starbridge, and it was, that was the very first time I showed up at a um, what are these events? Yeah, twenty. I'm going to say 2014. I think yeah, no, that yes. would be correct. That's yes. right. Yeah, we were at a high school there, um, Pedmore Technology College. That's right. Well, then I might have been correct in, when I said then the the last time. The last time we saw each other, yes, was yes, yes. <laughs> so um, that was the Keris's Keris organised the Raspberry Jam, and I believe she's got another one on next week, which sadly I can't get to at the library. Yes, in Stafford. Yes. Yeah. So, Tom, you have your own YouTube channel, and on that channel, you have been demonstrating these amazing little computers. Can you just spend? Oh, you've got some slides that you. I've want got to some show. slides, so we'll try. We'll run Let's through do my. That. Yes. yes. I, I came prepared, everybody. <laughs> you did. <laughs> what are you saying, Tom? You're saying I wasn't prepared. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see now. So you'll have to shout at me, Alan, and tell me you can see this. I can okay. see your, there we, go. Your, there we are. I can see there your slides we go. now. Okay, so my project I brought along was called Tiny Basic Computers. And it's been a project been running for about two years. It started just before we had the whole COVID and lockdown on my YouTube tech channel, which is called Wi-Fi Sheep. So my project goals for this was to make a project to actually build a real programmable computer that was accessible to as many people as possible. It had to use easily available all new parts. It couldn't cost a lot of money. The budget was about 20 to 30 pounds. So that's 25 to 40 US dollars. Most importantly, no specialist tools. So things like no soldering was a big rule and it had to be, and it had to be easily programmable, hence tiny basic. So I actually started with a bit of a classic gem, a 6502 microprocessor. Now, these things pretty much ran the 1980s. Uh, this is one of the rigs I brought along. The processor in particular came from a 1981 Acorn BBC Micro. The machine didn't work. I took the processor out. I manually wired it. And, well, there are problems. It needs a real 6502. It took a long time to wire it up. And... It was just the microprocessor. It was not a full computer. 
So the end results was it just blinked and flashed a bit. Not very exciting, unless you're really into vintage processors. And by the way, if you've got your phone, I've got QR codes throughout this presentation. So you can actually watch the whole video. We did this on the channel. It's there for you. I will move on. So tiny basic computers. It uses cheap off the shelf parts. It's actually powered by the Arduino Nano. It's easy to build. It's easy to understand. And most importantly, it runs as a real standalone 8-bit computer. That means it doesn't need another computer like a Raspberry Pi or a PC to work. It will boot up on its own. You put a keyboard in it for input. You put a TV or a monitor in it for output. And it's programmable with the 1976 version of Tiny Basic. Here is the most simplest rig you can make. This is a solderless breadboard. So all the parts just push into it and you can buy pre-cut wires. And it, so you just assemble it in about half an hour. And here is one rigged up with a keyboard and one of the little cafe tube black and white TVs. You don't have to use an old style TV. Most modern TVs can still accept the composite uh, video out. That's the yellow video jack I'm sure many of us remember seeing. Now, the biggest problem with computer kits is that you get diagrams that look like this. This is the schematic for the tiny basic computer. But unless you're an engineer, stuff like this looks pretty scary. But if I took that and I showed you this diagram, I had these printouts at Preston on the day, and I said, could you actually build that? That diagram and that diagram are of the same computer. And I say to people, could you actually build that? Even if you didn't know what the parts did, most people said, yes, they reckon they could. And there we are, there's actually a real version built from that diagram. So some links for you, the video series, this is building the whole thing, multiple videos online for free on our Tiny Basic Computers playlist. And we also have a Facebook group, and this is where you can download the hex ROM files. These are the bits of code you need to upload to the Arduino Nanos to make the uh, basic work. So it's the video terminal and the basic interpreter. Uh, it's all free, it's all there for you. There's QR tags and there's the links on screen right now. So this is where I'm gonna break things, Alan. You may have to step in. A quick live demo, let's see if this will work. So hopefully I just jump back. All looking good so far. Tom. I've lost, I've lost my way, oh, hang on. <laughs> Let's stop sharing. There we go. OK, so hopefully. If I jump to video two, you should see the command prompt on screen. So this is actually one of the systems that is actually running at the moment. It's coming through a capture card and it's live. So if I hit reset. We can actually reset and it comes up. Now, let's ask for some memory so I can type. MEM for memory, and it will show you how much memory it has in the system. Now you see it says 1019, that's bytes. So 1024 is usually 1K of RAM, and you need 1000K to make a megabyte. So we are dealing with very small amounts of memory here, but it is possible to do something with the machine. Now I have a piece of code already preloaded into the machine. So if I type E load, and I type list. There is a really small basic program, old school basic. It starts at one, then it jumps to 10, goes 20, 30, 40, and 50. If I now type run, you can see it just prints and counts random numbers. So it's a very simple program, but it's running on a real computer that I built out of bits, mostly powered by Arduino Nanos, including generating the video signal you're seeing on the screen. Obviously, if I'm running a looping program, I'm locked out, but I can hit escape and it breaks the program and we could list again if we wanted. Now, let's go back to presentation. So people ask me about the future. Well, one of the other exhibits I bought and the version you've just seen running was actually a PCB or printed circuit board version of the computer. Now, this is a little more complicated. It's still the same design, but you do need to be able to solder parts. But this is kind of where we're going with the project for people who want to sort of jump to the next level. And I was also asked, well, what about other boards? Like, for example, the brand new or recently released Raspberry Pi Pico. 
And I do actually have an experimental rig. That's what this photo is here of the Pico running, but it's a bit of a Frankenstein machine. So it's got half one of my PCBs. It's got a Raspberry Pi 400 plugged into it. And you can see one of the cafe rage monitors with the output on the other side. So we're not quite in a position to publish or show people yet. Lots of ideas for the future things I'm working on. Larger memories up to 16K, 32 bit running. This will be things like the Pico boards, which are 32 bit boards, not eight bit boards like the Arduino. Bitmap modes, graphics, high resolution color, VGA, removable storage, SD cards, real time operating systems, multiple language support, not just basic, mouse and GUIs, so that's click and point type systems. It might even be possible to get an early version of Windows to boot on a future system. So, details and links my channel, youtube.com forward slash Wi Fi sheep. Please do come over and visit us. There's lots of project content on there, not just tiny basic computers. I've been running for about five years now. That's a lot of content, both Raspberry Pi, vintage computing, such as uh, Commodore 64, BBC Micro, and of course the sort of maker projects I do, such as tiny basic computers. I'm on Twitter, it's at Wi Fi Sheep. And for those of you that feel particularly uh, generous, I do have a Patreon which you can join. And we do have some exclusive content and toolkit download content as part of our Tiny Basic Computers project. And that's from our $3 uh, or two pounds a month tier. That's over at patreon.com forward slash Wi-Fi sheet. If I've got time, Alan, just a cheeky little one, uh, shows coming up. Now, when I came to Preston, I honestly thought the Preston Make Fest was gonna be the only event this year due to COVID. And then all of a sudden, all these other shows exploded. So. We've already talked about Stafford Rose Supply Jam, which is Keris Locke's event. Uh, so I'm there from Tuesday 14th. Back in Cambridge, the Retro Computing Festival 2021, that's at the Centre for Computing History, has announced they are running and I am going to be there as an exhibitor. And then we're back to, I think we've got two more, or is it three more Stafford Rose Supply Jams. I do think there's going to be one in December as well. All links on that are on my website at events.wifisheet.co.uk. And I would say Q&A, but I might be out of time. We, we, we do have Anthony next, but we just we can I'm OK Anthony for a minute or two. Yes. <laughs> um, Tom, you mentioned Patreon and I know and I'm sure Anthony and a few others know. But do I just remind us what Patreon is and, and for listeners at home, people watching don't know? It's a social media platform in which uh, people who enjoy your content and want to basically tip you a little bit of money to say, thank you very much for making this. We want to support you financially. What you need to understand is Wi-Fi Sheep is quite a big part of my job. So my living is made from what I do here. So there's always a bit of a commercial element going on. And basically people can tip a dollar two dollars it's normally in us dollars but it does transfer to euros and pounds depending where you are in the world and for that you support me so i say thank you very much and in return i give you links to downloadable content so wi-fi sheep has about 30 videos that are in a private uh, playlist and there's also downloadable content such as bbc micro programs uh 3d print items and we have a toolkit for tiny basic which includes a bundle of software to make the system work so for uh, non-techie people, it's it's like the equivalent of your busking in the street. Yes. That anybody can listen to yes. for free. You've yes. You've got your hat there. I got the and, hat there. And, and people put things in the hat, they get that. You stop, you go, oh, thank you very much, person. It's just tip me. But oh, then, you the way, the, then you get an exclusive piece of music. Yes. yes at the same time. <laughs> that's kind of how it that works. That works really yeah. nicely. Um, and that's, that's why, Tom, it, you know, it's nice to hear. We're, we're not saying you have to do these things, but these you know they're out there if people feel that they want to support and, yes. and contribute yeah. um thank you very much um and i'll just repeat tom did mention his wife his youtube channel it was it was on there tom might even go over to youtube now in the chat and he might just put another link to that put in, in there but youtube.com forward slash wi-fi sheep or one okay. word and tom thank you so much for joining us now we're going to move to anthony <laughs> and actually I can I just show Tom yeah. what I've been working on? <laughs> Please do. Here you go, Tom. I've been working on something as well. That's, that you oh! Did, the Pico Pi. Yeah. And I'm also doing a Risk Five based. Okay. Yeah. An FPGA yeah. on the side. Oh, no, that's so, yeah. That's the kind of ballpark we're getting into. Eventually, that's really cool. Thanks for yeah, showing us so, that. 
<laughs> I really don't know where you people find the time for these kind of projects. <laughs> Anthony was mentioning early on a code club that you do at a primary school. Uh, oh, yeah. In Grimser um, before. Yeah. I'll, well, I can't mention the name because I don't know if I'm well, allowed. We might not mention the name of the school, but we can say anybody <laughs> yes, who knows Grimser four, will five, know. Six, uh, but it's been off for the last, I don't know now, 18 months because yeah. of COVID. Um, so... And, and I mean, there are code clubs in other schools. It was just it, there was a bit of chatter going on in the green room yeah, before. Yeah. And you mentioned that you you support the code club as a primary school in Grimser. Yeah. So, I mean, some people won't even know how to spell Grimser or they'll try and say it like Grim yeah. <laughs> R or something like that. Um, so a little bit of a, a, a funny story here in a way or a funny peculiar is that, Anthony, you and I first met at a computer club back in the and 1980s or so. <laughs> Yeah, Preston Atari computer enthusiasts. Yeah, and I, you know, for the record, I don't know that you nor I owned an Atari computer. I didn't at the beginning. Uh, I was saving up. I used to go into Lasky's and program theirs on a Saturday morning, figuring it all out, and I learned assembly code, six five one two. Um, Whereas I had my Sinclair ZX81, it might as well have been made out of cardboard. <laughs> the one I have now. And the reason I mention this is because um, a lot of people will say they never knew that computer club ever existed. And that's mm. the point where I was a little bit worried that our jam in the university, in that room, while we've got fantastic facilities and the university are very happy to support us. What if somebody had lived in Preston for 20 years or so and never knew we were doing those things? Mm. So that was the intention of our event at the Harris Museum was to say to the world, look, here's Anthony. You might have seen Anthony years ago, maybe in the <laughs> news or, or mm. you know, some of, the, some of the very exciting and adventurous projects that Anthony <laughs> has worked on. Uh, hint, hint. However, here's something else that Anthony is doing. So tell us, what did you bring along to make fest? I don't know if I can share my screen. Yeah, you can do that if you want. How do I do that? You, the, see where it says share screen? Uh, <laughs> the toolbar. Oh, yeah, got it. Yeah, okay. Good job. Good job, Anthony. Joined the technical uh, rehearsal earlier. Screen three, is that sharing? Do I have to do a share? It's, can you see that? We can now see a, a screen full of code. Okay. Okay. Well, the, this is um, Gitteros. It's a it's a Lua based engine, and it exports to all the platforms. It's free, open source. Um, I'm one of the people who helped contribute to it. I'm not one of the main ones, but I'm one of them. And uh, this is a little bit of code. This is part of a game. So if I show you the game, that's the game. This is the code here, which does the split screen. So all that code, that code there, handles this split screen. So one player can move off while the other one. So if I resume it, you can see it handles that. And then when they go together, seamlessly joins it back. And the, the code that you need in Lua to do that is just that little bit there. From there wow. to there. That handles all the maps, the split, the seamless join, everything. So that's all you need for that kind of thing. You know, like in the Lego games where they split the screen. And while we've been running our jams in Preston for nine years, next year will be our 10th year. I would say for, for a good deal, many of those years, you've been trying to say to the world, this Gideros, it's fantastic. You need oh, yeah. to... <laughs> <laughs> you, I've never seen you wear the T-shirt, but you've certainly been waved the flag quite a few oh, yeah. times. It's, it's good and it's free. We teach it at the Code Club, along with things like Scratch and a couple of other, other ones. But Lua's used in a lot of engines. So if you learn it in this, they can use it for Roblox. And, and it, you know it's incredibly I mean? powerful. I mean, compared to some other programming languages, it renders graphics very smoothly, yeah, and very if, quickly. If you, if you see there, it's running even on the slowest machines that runs at 60 frames per second. So, um, you know. And you've also been able to publish games using... Yeah, Gideros. you can export to all the different platforms, everything, Android, iOS, Windows, even the Xbox. So if there was a young person in your family or, or you knew yeah. somebody who was that way inclined, there's... Well, I, like you, well, you know, I used to program games in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. In assembly code but um about 10 10 years ago now 
um, I wanted to show my kids how to program games. And um, this seemed to be the best, the best um, platform to do it on. So if we, we want to talk about Saturday now. So on Saturday, oh, yeah. you brought a, you had a short Can I stop projective. sharing my screen? How do if I you, stop sharing my screen? If you wish, yeah, just <laughs> click where it says. <laughs> no idea. <laughs> click on the share screen thing, or I can. Uh, it's can... gone. <laughs> oh, there it is. Don't worry. Um, it's fine because we can see it at the same All time. Right. It's relevant. Yes. Okay. So on Sas on Saturday last week, Saturday twenty yeah. eighth, you had a you had one of your games running on 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 a, on a yeah, large screen. Yeah, it was screen. this one and a couple of other ones. So and don't worry, I well, what I can do in a moment is I can put some photos on just to, so people can see. But we got some fantastic photos where. <laughs> I mean, when people say people's faces lit up, quite literally, people's faces were lit up uh, by the colours from the game. Um, yeah. And I've, I, I'm going to share some photos now from the event. So we've got one here on the screen. So um, the, I noticed people didn't really want to leave your space. They were happy to stay there. Yeah, kids for, like playing the game. They do. Do you think yeah, that's a bad thing? Bash, so, you know, at Rockford. Okay. Do you think with some new ideas? Do you think them wanting to stay and play the game kind of defeated your purpose in being there? Uh, yeah, I think the different events would be better if we had some workshops. I think if you if you did it, say at the university, if the university give you some space, and um, if you use their rooms because like, you need the computers, and um, they have they have the presentation stuff there and everything else, which would make things a lot better. Um, you could do some workshops. I think if you did it over two days as well, I think it'd be better rather than one day. That way, people who have to travel a long distance, it's not uh, just one day that they could get Indeed. there. And it's more worthwhile for them to travel that distance. But if we reflect back on what was the theme of, or what was the purpose of Make Fest, Preston Make Fest, it was to show people you can do these things, oh, yeah. not to show them necessarily how to do them. Hmm. And in that photo there, I, I think I can zoom in just a little bit. You had one screen was showing here's the code, yeah, like the engine, and then yeah. on the on this slide. yeah, and I was showing people say for example you want to change the level up, you change the level that you start at, and the graphics to the level on the computer, and how many lives you've got, how many credits you've got, and things. It's just a variable in the program, so. And you did create a little bit of a problem for us because it was hard for people to get past. Yeah. <laughs> so there was yeah. this crowd of people to watch. I don't think part of that as well, maybe in the fact that you had the, the, the projector, I thought that was a mm. really good idea where if you just had two small screens. It, yeah, would, I don't think it, it would have been as good. You know? So it was, it, it, in some ways, it was almost as attractive as the R2-D2 because you had something enormous that people could relate to you don't often see games on, on on such a large screen so anybody else going to a festival like that although it did for us as the organizers cause a little bit of a problem because i mean we had to darken the room because yeah. anthony needed the oh, room yeah. to be darker um here's george he was there yeah hello george yeah <laughs> we've seen you in the photos it's, 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 did you did yeah. you beat your dad at the game um you no. know do you know what? He it's let George's his... voice, who's who's the, the zombie saying brains and stuff in the games, and he helped influence the game. That's that's a good thing. You can, um, I do these games kind of for fun, really. So, and there know. was there was one where we've got Lucy's voice in. Is what rhymes with purple? That was another. Oh, one, right, it? with Martians. Oh, we couldn't yeah. think of what the a name for the game, and there was Martians in it. We couldn't find anything that rhymed with the word Martians, so we just that, decided to call that game. What <laughs> um, Anthony, that's brilliant. Thank you so much for supporting okay. our event. Thank you for bringing something that drew in the crowds. And um, hopefully at a future event, we can have some workshops where people can explore the potential. of Gideros Yeah, if any, like I said, if anyone events. wants to learn to program yeah. Lua, if they go to Gideros, the forums, is, they're really helpful. And, and it's a dead easy language to learn. Like we teach it year five and six at primary school. Wow. So. It's That's really brilliant. easy. It's kind of like Python, but easier and faster. Okay. So thank you very much, Anthony right. and George. Bye. Hope to see you at our events in the future. Okay. So now, we've got just two more people who, who I think are going to join us this evening, if we got it right. 
Um, I'm looking for our next one, John, and um, I think John may be in the green room at the moment, so I might have to see if I can move John into the main session, if he's still there. John can probably hear me around about now, if that's working. If not, we might just jump to Josh as our next one. Um, while I'm waiting for John to join us, let me remind you of a few things. So we are reflecting and reviewing. Oh, here's John. John has now. Um, are you there, John? You are muted at the moment. We can see a lovely coloured pattern of lights on your screen, on your camera. Alan? Um, yes. Right. There's, a, there's an interesting part of the pattern on the bottom set of lights. Those that have done arithmetic. Ah. See if they can spot the pattern. Is it to do with a very kind of rudimentary system for counting something to do like that mm. so it's possible i've either got it or i haven't got it Go on. <laughs> like is, is it true or false perhaps well each light represents something being one and off now if you notice the right hand side but if you can, uh, if I can, you can see, you've got three, two, oh, one, gone out, gone yeah. out, going out, bang, a lot more on. So, so it's reversing, it's counting backwards in binary. Yes, it's ah. counting backwards in binary. So it's a one. So it'll always, it'll always finish with the very last light on the right hand side, which is also known as the least significant bit. Mm -hmm. Correct. Ah, okay. So, so John, so this well, was one of the projects that you brought along to our MakeFest event on, on Saturday, the 28th of August. Yes. And it's something that I imagine members of the public would look at it. And if you told them this was a computer, they might even get into an argument with you and say, that's not a computer. Was that the case? Um, actually, they were just looking at the lights see the lights um and yes basically i was telling them that uh, many many years ago i could even say previous millennium computers um when you you tried, started a computer it didn't just you put the power on and it worked it was working away you had to do extra bits and pieces so you see all these little buttons here yep Toggle you switches. Can, yeah, the toggle switches there. You can use those to set up an address in the computer. You can then put information at that address, again, using these toggle switches. And then you can go to the next address, next piece of data. And eventually you'll have a small program which can be then used to run something like a paper tape. Ah. So, so you can pull the paper tape through. You've spotted here one of the problems with paper tape, they keep falling down. And basically you can put the program, um, load the program which leads the paper, which starts the paper tape reader up, and then the paper tape reader will then reload the program into the computer, um, which makes it things a bit easier by using paper tape. Um, unfortunately, so, um, paper tape can be a bit, as you see, temperamental. Uh, yes. Yeah. I think that's the word I'm looking for. And John, for. This, am I right in saying this is a, a reproduction of a, what was originally called a PDP 11, because this is yes. based around the Raspberry Pi. They've called it a Pi DP 11. Yes. Basically, so, it's a two thirds model, two thirds ah, replica okay. of a PDP 11. I, I produced um, a document. Um, I don't know if you can see. Yeah, that. we can so see that. Can... Yeah. Right. So... Ah, okay. So there's a photograph where you can see the full size. Yeah, and next to... there's the two thirds size. Yeah. So I called it Beauty and the Beast. And I'll leave you to sit think about which one's a beauty and which one's a beast. And are you going to tell me that back in the early 1970s or so, you were learning to program using something like this? Um, actually, it was the 1980s. Ah, okay. 
Um, and the first person, I was working at a computer company called ICL, and we had a special graphics terminal which could show the integrated circuit layout. But it was controlled by uh, an equivalent to this PDP 11. Um, and you, the first person in that wanted to use the graphics terminal, had to bootstrap, which is load the program in using the using the keys in, so that, that first of all it could then bounce up the um, disk drive, which could then load up the program, which could then control the graphics terminal. So you could then start to see the layout of a, the integrated circuits that were being used and developed by ICL at the time. It, it is quite a beautiful thing to watch over a period of time because the, the lights are quite mesmerizing. If, if we watch films from the 1950s and 60s that show what computers were going to look like, yeah. um, they, they made a lot more no noise and there was whistles and buzzes and bangs, whereas this would the original PDP-11 have been as silent as this one? Um, no, because probably the tape drive would have been whirring away like mad. Yes, okay. Um, and I mean the magnetic tape drives, not and, the paper tape. So Anthony's just mentioned that he also learned programming, the language COBOL on an ICL computer at what yes. was... Pre previous version of the university in Preston called Preston Polytechnic yeah. using punch cards and paper. Now, yeah. John, um, cool. you've been you've been attending our physical jams in Preston when we hold them at UCLan in that space for for a very long time. And you strike me as the unlike myself, you 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 you're not one who necessarily wants to stand up on a stage in front of lots of people and say, "Hey, everybody, look at this! Look at this!" But you always bring some interesting projects along and you have them on a the table and people always find their way over to you. And you seemed very much in that capacity at our event, the Makefest event. Would you say so? Yes. Yeah. Um, having been taught for only six years, I thought I'd get out and went into computing. So, um, yes, I'd rather people look at the look. The, uh, the wonderful lights, uh, and then it's almost one to one, really, where I'm feeling but, better at. But nonetheless, as people, I noticed at the event, people were coming over and they were speaking to you and asking questions. And we did have, which I had on the screen earlier, some nice photos of people. You could see puzzled looks on their faces as they were concentrating. Um, does that sound right? You, do, do with people, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, basically, what I was um, asking usually the first thing I asked when I had a new um, person come along is, "What does the white switch do?" Alan, um, what does the white switch do? Is is it execute, run, write, store? I'll give you a word. It starts with T, ends in T, and has ES in the middle. Oh, it's a test button. Okay. So I don't know if you can see now. Yeah, it flips up. Basically, ah. it, it checks all the, all the lights are working. Yeah. Because as you can see, the lights are on, but I don't know whether or not they're completely working. We and don't so know if there's anybody home. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what the test button was there for. And uh, I showed some people um, little LEDs that were that were used inside here, and. Um, I gave one or two away, so you might have people so that building for light systems. Yeah. Well, maybe if they look at some of Tom's materials on his channel, they could start building their own version. Yeah. Uh, uh, reflecting on the event, John, one thing that, you know, Anthony and Brian and a few others have said this evening is it would have been nice to have hands on workshops. Um, but I'm guessing you would kind of disagree in a way. It's nice to have things just to show people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, things that are working is better. Uh, unfortunately, my uh, test reader wasn't reading, um, so I was a bit disappointed with that. So it requires people to use their imagination just a little bit. Sometimes, yes. Yeah. But, they, could, but they, they look at the paper tape and, and just imagine how much information is there. Yeah. In fact, I think this is a 4K um, byte tape. 
which is going to be which can be uh, used for another of my toys, um, which of course has another set of lights on the front. Uh, John, I'm I'm going to move on to our final speaker, but I'd love to say again thank you. I know you 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 hadn't been in terrific shape beforehand and you were a bit worried that some of your projects might not be finished before the event but thank you so much for coming and supporting our make fest event and yeah. looking forward to seeing you again when we get on when we start holding more events in the future yeah and well, we have thanks. our thank you john and we have our okay. final guest who's going to join us now shortly it's josh and um I had some photos on the screen earlier. Let me see. Can I find those photos now? Just while Josh connects his audio and makes sure everything's working. So I took you on a little tour around. We were looking at Anthony's um, displays that Anthony had. Are you there, Josh? Ready to join us? You're going to unmute? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. So while I scroll through these photos, I'm going the wrong way, actually. I meant to be getting towards the end. We also had some families who were they weren't able to join us tonight. So some families came along and they brought um, some of their projects. So there was a, a, a young lad called Andrew. He, he's, he's been building a, a vehicle. We had eyes. Oh, there's, there's Andrew's vehicle. Uh, we had Isaac was building things in Minecraft um, in Georgia and um, going the wrong way there again. So and then we went back to our photos at the end so so josh let's let's just for a moment let's turn back the clock a lot let's go back nine years ago to one of our, our very very first jam and i could ask you questions about that but you probably won't be able to tell me a lot because you weren't there you weren't at our first jam no i think um the first event that i actually uh went to in preston i don't think it was a raspberry jam i think so was it how many was it 2013 that uh, on a Saturday you ran? I think it was once a month or something like that. Uh, yeah. It was a uh, oh, what was it? Was it Hack Jam? Is that have I got the yeah, right name? Yeah, 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 probably something like uh, that. In the yeah. same room, I think, though. Um, so it was like a, a similar format to the jam, but kind of more, I think it was more focused towards people my age. Yeah. That's kind of like how I got into it uh, nearly nine years ago. And then you did start coming to our jams and you had this very strong, clear ambition that you wanted to use code to build and create things. And at that time, while you enjoyed school, you didn't feel school could really give you what you needed. So you knew or you hoped that coming to something like our jams would help. Yeah, I think um, I think the, so. the idea was like, you know, if if you're into football or tennis or something like that then you know there are clubs that you can go to for those kind of things but like those weren't really my interests so uh you know i had a i had an interest in computers and messing about with uh different things like that uh, and you know that was kind of the only thing that was up and running at the time and i thought oh well um it was actually my mum that found out about it through a colleague um so i went along and then kind of it went from there and nine years it's still i'm still attending um and yeah, I've learned lots. And uh, so it's helped in some way. Oh yeah, it's helped massively. Yeah. Um, I mean, like I don't think if if you know the hack jams and the raspberry jams didn't exist, I probably wouldn't know what a raspberry pi is, or you know, I probably wouldn't be doing what I am now. So, I mean, I mean it is quite incredible when we look back, and we're not going to go into all of it now. But you, you, you have you, you, you have now started a career in software development recently. I would say started. Well, you did actually start. The difference is, you're on a salary now. You work for a company, and you're developing software for a company while you're working. Yes, am I correct? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Um, I've been doing an apprenticeship for the past year, and that was kind of like. Um, so I spoke to a few people. Um, before the pandemic, a few months before, uh, I was trying to decide, or you know, do I go to college or do I look at a different path and see what the other options are? I decided that um, you know an apprenticeship might be the best way, and it turned out to be the the best option, especially with, I mean, obviously at the time when I uh, signed up to do an apprenticeship, I didn't know what the next eighteen months had in store with the pandemic and stuff, but um, yeah, it definitely turned out to be the right. 
So we, we um, just to mention people who don't know this, but Josh, is, you're now part of our planning and organizing group. So um, when the pandemic did come and we're having these conversations, well, what are we going to do? Are we going to stop running the jams? You, you've been integral to, to those planning discussions right from the onset. And I, I think if I'm correct, when I said, do you know what, we should do something on a Saturday and get members of the public along, I had this impression that you had your head in your hands and you were, no, I, I don't think this is going to work, Alan. So you're able to you're able to prove me wrong now. Yeah, you're able to say it was a stupid idea. No, no, it was a good idea. Um, I think I think one of the problems that we had was like, you know, what does what does the event in person look like at the minute? Obviously, you know, at the time when we were discussing, you know, the hybrid in person events or whatever it was, um, you know, we didn't know what the restrictions would be and that kind of thing. Um, but it turned out to be really good, you know. I think the the venue obviously was a last minute change because of where we originally wanted to do it. Um, but I think it was a good idea to have it in the house because, you know, like many people mentioned this evening, you know, you get you get people in there who wouldn't necessarily come to an event at the university or um, a different venue where we normally run the jam. Uh, so yeah, I think it was a good decision to kind of get people who might have a, an interest, but you know, like me nine years ago, have an interest but don't know where to go to kind of meet other people who are interested in the same thing. And I, mean, I think it'll be too early to, to judge any outcomes or results as, a, a, you know, that somebody came and since attending Makefest has decided to, but but like just like yourself, perhaps in years to come, if we are doing more things like this where we do go out and hold things more in the public we may reach more young people and older people as well who who decide that this is something that they want to do but was there anything in particular you felt was worked really well on the Saturday at the Harris I mean you you have mentioned the fact that we we're meeting people we wouldn't normally meet so anything else that stood out for you or we can just move on to talk about uh, no, I think I think probably the standout thing for me is someone who has been going to these events for you know the past nine years and stuff. It was quite a good opportunity to because obviously you know the Preston Make Fest was one of the first events that had um, you know happened since all the events stopped last March. Um, so I think it was a good place for you know people across the country to come along and meet people who they've they missed over the past eighteen months and. You know, we had people from Cambridge, uh, Birmingham, uh, Manchester, uh, you know, uh, people who, you know, we usually see at the events and um, people we know off uh, online and Twitter who, you know, we've seen at a few events, but might not necessarily necessarily see at every event. Um, so, yeah, I think that was a good opportunity to kind of meet people who uh, we've missed over the past 18 months and, you know, make those connections again. And yeah, it was nice that some of those people, you know, made, took tremendous effort and personal cost to to come and, and visit us where we're used to traveling to them, are we, to Cambridge and Manchester and London to see those kind of things. And we, a lot of people have mentioned hands-on workshops that would have made the event perhaps a lot better in terms of its reach and engagement. Was there anything else that occurred to you that you thought might have made the event more no, I think I think um, you know, obviously, you know, it was the first time that we'd done something like that, especially you know, given the restrictions and stuff that we had in place. I think you know, it was the right mix of different things that people could see. Um, you know, obviously, we we've learned things for next time, and um, obviously, you know, the workshops is hopefully something we can do. Um, you know, if restrictions are eased a bit more and people feel a bit more comfortable actually sitting down and you know getting hands on with some uh, equipment and that kind of stuff and um, so yeah I think that's something that we can hopefully do next year. Okay well Josh thank you very much now one of the things we're going to do in a moment is we're going to open our jam jar uh, for people who've never joined us before it, it, this is our playful name for our breakout rooms um, what what you might be able to see on the screen now is there is now a link on the screen it says how to join our jam jar and and i've just posted it into the youtube chat as well um 
Well, it's called Jamjar. The link is http colon slash slash exit dot is forward slash r jam jar kind of rhymes that last bit so um if you haven't joined one of these jam jar sessions my advice to you would be join now when you as soon as you can with the link i'll have to let you in and i have to do that um and i need to rename the green room <laughs> we'll have this main room here i will stop the recording i will stop i will say goodbye to people on youtube shortly in fact i'm going to stop the recording now so let me just stop that that would just take a moment. I feel like somebody else saying, where's the 